Hi everyone, I'm Steph. And I'm Katie. And we are super excited to be here for the second Boyfriend Material book club video. And we're really excited to have Alexis here today to answer some questions. Hi Alexis. Oh, uh, I'm Alexis. Hi. Uh, sorry, I was, I'm really in, uncertain in this kind of thing. It's a British thing, I apologize. Is also okay, um, so we're going to ask you a few questions if you're up for that. Uh, yes, I hope, I hope so. That's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the first one is, what is a trope that you love that you haven't written yet? Is there a trope that you don't normally like to read that you'd like to take on the challenge of writing and or subverting like you did in Boyfriend Material? Ooh, um, like, so, so the, the one that I am not a huge fan of but wanted to subvert was arguably the build on thing that I did with the uh, the Ardy books. Um, like I have a partly for kind of you know social consciousness reasons, I find the fetishization of billionaires really difficult, but also there's a bunch of stuff in those in, in that that I wanted in the way those books sometimes play out that I wanted to do takes on. In terms of things I haven't done, um, I'd quite like to do Marriage in Peril. Um, there is also a tiny part of me that's really, really into Secret Baby. <laughs> um, obviously has, has huge kind of, um, obviously there's a lot of baggage attached to, secret, attached to Secret Baby and there's a lot of kind of difficult implications and some difficult ethical implications at the end of it. And obviously, because I write LGBTQ+, doing a queer version could be tricky. There's a tiny, tiny part of me that thinks it would be cool to do a secret baby book where she's a straight woman and he's a gay man and they're not in love. It's just about their relationship focusing around a kid. Um, but obviously that's probably a bit of a weird sell. <laughs> I would read it. <laughs> I would also probably read it. I, like I weirdly, I'm, I never say I love Secret Baby, but I always end up reading Secret Baby and I'm like, this was so good. <laughs> it's a fun one, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, so a lot of your books feature painfully awkward dinner parties or social gatherings that go wrong. Is there a memorable situation in your own life or, you know, kind of where do you draw for these scenes? I mean, the, the, re the really glib answer is that I'm British, so my entire life is like that. Um, <laughs> I, partly, I, I, I often find social situations quite awkward in general. I think um, it's, there's, no, there's no one thing. It's not like I had one really memorable, awkward social situation. It's just a, a slow drip of an awful lot of little things where you're just in a situation that everyone wants to be out of. Um, yeah, and I do it a lot. Like I, like I think it's, I think I hold it up as, the, as the, the, the thing that makes you know you're in an Alexis Hall book is when you're in an awkward social situation that everybody wants to leave and nobody can. Um, but yeah, no, it's just, it's, it's just my life. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I totally enjoyed being inside Luke's head during these kinds of situations. Um, okay, let's see. So one of our readers um, said that they love how food is another character in Boyfriend Material, and it has a lot to say about the complicated nature of our relationship with food. Did yeah. you know when you started writing that food would have such a significant part of the story or did that come about as you were writing? They also thanked you for writing about disordered eating since they don't see it often in books. Um, so it's, um, sorry, yeah. So I, I very seldom know anything when I start. So I, mean, I, like, I don't sit down with a big thing saying, these are going to be my themes. I will do this, this and this. But um, I, I, I do food a lot, um, partly because I like food. Um, like it's in like it, it's sort of important to me personally. Uh, I cook a fair amount, um, not well, but a fair amount. Um, I think it's also it's again it's a, it's a caretaking thing that people can do for each other that I think carry has a whole stack of weight behind it that I think is which, which I hope is accessible and sort of fairly. Uh, I hate calling things universal because you call something universal and what you're actually doing is you're excluding the probably quite large group of people to whom it doesn't apply. But um, there's a lot of shared cultural assumptions around food. Like there is, you know that there is a difference between the kind of person who makes French toast and the kind of person that makes a sausage pie, even if you're, um, even if you're not super deeply intimate with, with the culture. Um, in terms of... Um, I think also because because I wanted Oliver to be 
you know, very sort of complimentary to Luke and because Luke's got this whole, I hate myself, I'm an awful person thing and therefore Oliver is very, very ethical. That meant that vegetarianism in particular was an important part of Oliver's character and then that led me down a, 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 a sort of a vegetarianism rep rabbit hole of kind of wanting to look at, you know, the ethics of vegetarians and different reasons to be vegetarian, um, a different, um, <laughs> uh, there were a couple of annoying vegans in it and then I realised that I couldn't only have two annoying vegans because that's <laughs> like, I mean, there, there, are, there are millions and millions of groups of people that get referred to as like, you know, the large group of people that's like getting prejudiced about, but like, I, I don't actually like dissing vegans, so I wanted to make sure there was at least one vegan in it who wasn't a prick um, and who had good reasons for their beliefs. Um, so yeah, it was, it, was, it was a combination of things. It's a, it's a, the eating disorder thing was partly, um, so it, partly I sometimes like to have issues in a book that's not about those issues. I think it's really important that you don't only see someone with an eating disorder in a book that's a very special book about anorexia. Um, and part of it is, um, this is one of those things where I'm very conscious. I'm going to say some things now and all the women in the audience are going to go, uh-huh, yeah, oh, really sad for you. But um, like one of the things that I think has become increasingly noticeable recently is the kind of unrealistic expectations you get on male bodies. Um, like there's the whole story about how for that one scene in The Witch, uh, like, um, oh, I've got this, Henry Cavill had to not drink water for six days and things. Um, and, and again, women in the audience, feel free to play the world's smallest violin because, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but the flip side of this is that like, you know, you don't, you don't fix social injustice by just doing it more to more people. Like Black Lives Matter aren't asking for the cops to shoot more white people. Um, and so um, one, one of the things that I often struggle with when writing romance is there is a sort of a, an assumption that heroes will have a certain type of body and increasingly it's a certain type of body that you you have to put a lot of work into and you can probably put a lot of, put that amount of work into your body if you don't have an eating disorder especially if you are like you know a model or a personal trainer or the kind of person that that makes sense for but when you're a barrister you don't look that way unless there's something up i think is the um sorry that was long a bit outside my lane and i apologize for that no, that's okay. It's really interesting. We were um, just talking about that earlier today about like Oliver's V cut and how he is very obsessed with not eating certain things because he thinks he needs to have a certain yeah. body type. And that's really interesting. Yeah, it's easy. It's easy. We're deliberate. <laughs> so, are there any music icons that inspired Luke's parents? This is a difficult question because obviously Luke's dad in particular is a total prick. And so if I say, oh yes, this total prick is based on someone. Um, Personality-wise, um, uh, John Fleming is just kind of based on what I imagine a famous asshole would be like. Um, kind of look, and music style-wise is sort of drawn on, Jet like quite inspired by Jethro Tull. Um, I say by Jethro Tull, Jethro Tull's a band, but like the the... the there's a, even a reference in the book to him like hopping around with a flute and that's really because he can't mind just to hop around with a flute. Um, the style of music he does is very inspired by that kind of 70s, 80s yeah. British rock, rock era. Um, a lot of his, like, I think a lot of his anecdotes he's got are mostly made up, but some of them are loosely inspired by like things that I vaguely heard that Iggy Pop did or the bloke from the Pogues did. And things like that. Um, I've actually got a got a uh, uh, a, a, a public um uh, playlist on my Spotify, which is a uh, uh, which is a, the John Fleming Primer, which is sort of a, a hop skip and a jump through the the sort of um, music that kind of inspired that. Um, warning again, it's, it's all dudes because he's quite a sexist bloke. Um, but that's him. As for um, deal um is partly. I always imagine it being a bit like a, like Adele, which is obviously really anachronistic, um, but, but partly just because Adele is great. Um, she's, and again, she's a, she's a little bit Joan Baez, um, she's a little bit Susie Sue, um, a little bit you know, made up for the book, because it's, the, the way, the, the one of things based on questions always kind of throw me, because I always feel like you haven't got anything 
it feels like a bad face answer. And if you've got too much, you're just like, oh yeah, no, no put no creative work into it at all. I just, it's just this person. It's just, yeah, it's just, it's just Steve from down the road. But put me a different hat. Okay, I have a surprise question for you, but it was too funny and I wanted your genuine reaction. <laughs> um, on a scale of one to 10, what's your level of regret that Oliver did not text a pic of Moby Dick to Luke? Oh God, at least an eight. <laughs> I mean, at least an eight. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm trying to remember if, because if, obviously I went, I went through a lot of, like, um, again, to, to, to uh, hope of not being too behind the curtain, I went through a lot of dicks. Um, <laughs> and then it was a back and forth about it. So one of the, one of the realities of being a British writer, writing with an American publisher, an American audience, is you sometimes get feedback where you're like, oh, Americans won't know who this is. And so you have to go, there, okay, okay, is this an appropriate dick? Is this a dick Americans will know who it is? Is this a dick that's like, is this dick too political? Is this dick too, um, uh, too obscure? <laughs> And yeah, yeah, Moby Dick would have been perfect, actually, because it's really iconic. It's really ob obviously recognisable to Americans because it's an iconic American novel. Uh, obviously recognisable outside of America because it's like, yeah, no, you're right, uh, you're right. Uh, like the the really depressing thing is, I'm not sure that even occurred to me until you mentioned it. Um, <laughs> obviously, like, what, we had a genius reader submit that question, and I was just like, I read it and cackled. Oh, and I, was too oh I am, I am legit. So I like, I might actually just give up writing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was the reaction that I wanted. <laughs> okay, let's do um, one more. Okay, and we'll go into the discussion. So I think this is kind of a fun one to, to end on too. Um, so what's the WhatsApp group currently called? I mean, so if they go with their usual policy of, you know, doing LGBTQ puns, they probably call something like stand by your pan. But given the current circumstances, it's probably called "Shit, There's a Plague." <laughs> that seems appropriate. <laughs> love it, love it. <laughs> okay, so thank you for answering yes. all of our questions. Thank um, you. We're going to talk about chapters eleven through thirty, which is about page seventy-five to two. I'm not even sure. I just had it to 250. Um, so Katie, what was your favorite part of this section? When they go out to dinner with Alex and Miffy. Yes. I... <laughs> <laughs> Alex, oh. I stan Alex. <laughs> Those scenes, they're both like Alex and Miffy together, like are an absolute riot. They're so good and like I just I love the part where um, they meet Miffy for the first time and Alex introduces her as Clara and he is very Luke is very confused about why Miffy is the nickname because it's the same amount of syllables and it's just hilarious. And I mean we have some like really really great exchanges that happen but like honestly one of my favorites is when Oliver realizes he may know Alex's father. And he's like, um, are, you, are you related to uh, Richard Twaddle? And he's like, my father actually, God rest his soul. Um, I stared at him. Alex, you never told me your dad died. Oh, he didn't. Why would you think that? <laughs> because, I mean, never mind. <laughs> just, Alex is so great. He's wonderful. That entire, like, scene <clears throat> where they're going out to eat is wonderful. I love that Alex stays around. Um, I can't wait to see what happens with Alex in the rest of the book. And it like, I feel like that dinner really solidifies them as a couple, fake couple, because they're still pretending, supposedly. And um, I love that after it ends and they go back to Luke's, which side note, can we just talk about the fact that Luke cleans his apartment for Oliver and like I don't know why that particular detail just like brought me so much joy I think it was Luke like realizing how much he cares about Oliver and then like him trying to keep it clean like freaking out to keep it clean I, just, I don't know well Back and the story well, but I also Oliver. love that Oliver didn't ask him so it's not like Oliver's not trying to change him but Luke is like, you know, I feel like this is something that 
I, I need to do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then of course we get a sleepover again. And I just, they're too cute for words. Like I was rereading parts of this section before we um, jumped on here. And I came across the part where um, they're talking about how they almost slept together at Bridget's birthday a couple of years ago and Oliver like outright rejects him. And Luke is just like, why? Like, just because I was drunk doesn't mean we can't, we couldn't have slept together. I would have been fine. And Oliver goes, oh, Lucian, how can I explain this? I don't want fine. Fine isn't enough. It's not about the open fire or whatever other cliches you can conjure up. But yes, I want a connection. I want you to care as much as I care. I want you to need it and want it and mean it. I want it to matter. And like, uh, because <laughs> yeah. so we get, mean. you know, we're inside Luke's head. So we kind of get, you know, how his feelings are developing, but we, we don't necessarily get that from Oliver. And so I feel like this was really the first look into that. And you're just like, <sighs> yeah, <it's> sweet just, boy. <laughs> I know. Uh, we just love Oliver. Um, and then later in this section, um, oh, wait, we should talk about the paparazzi after the dinner. Oh, Don't yeah, because that part. Because the um, this was literally their first public outing because they hadn't really done something to be like, hey, look, I'm cleaning up my act. Look at this, this great guy I'm dating. Um, and so Luke kind of has a, a run in with the paparazzi and he's very, very, very overwhelmed. And Oliver just kind of steps in and is like, I got you. And I'm just like, oh, my heart. <laughs> There's so many little things like that throughout this whole section, like the part where they're in bed and Luke is being a little self-conscious and Oliver's just like, come here. And he just like cuddles him. It is so cute. I love it. And then we get our first kiss. Yay! It's adorable. And Luke is like, wait, you only kiss people you like. And obviously Oliver likes him. <laughs> it just is very swoony. There's lots of swoony sections or yes. parts of this section. Well, I'm very no, good. I mean, oh, say that, that again. Cool. I'll, I'll be quite quiet because it's, it's, it's difficult for me to chime in and say, yes, that is good. I'm <laughs> <laughs> I am here. I, I, I am listening. <laughs> um, what is your favorite? Part. Do you have a favorite part oh, of like well, them I, just being adorable? I mean, I, so, so, I, I mean, from the from the section you've so obviously spoiler. I didn't actually reread thirty chapters of my own book <laughs> for this. So I, I I I I do admit that a lot of what I like is the I obviously the spoony bits are great, but particularly because the book's kind of a tribute to a bunch of slightly stupid comedy stuff from the 90s. I do really enjoy the really nice comedy stuff. Like um like 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 the bit with Alex implying his father is dead for no reason and that never being explained is um I don't think I stole that beat from a BBC sitcom in the 90s, but I could have. I think <laughs> the idea like there's a there's a like that kind of very posh genuinely you can't understand how a person can possibly like how a person can possibly be that out of it character is a really major trope in the Juliet based on. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's the stuff I like is the stupid jokes. You know, I I, I like the two wells and the mini bit. <laughs> it, it adds That's such. Cool. I was Go gonna ahead. say it adds such great humor. Like yeah, because, because there are like serious topics. Yeah, in the book, I also um, I just have to mention back with Alex the hashtag Ollivander bit, <laughs> where like Miffy is saying that Oliver and Alex should date. And um, Alex is like, I've read the Harry Potter series, like, I don't know, 40 times or something because he finishes it and forgets how it started. <laughs> it's just, uh, he's so wonderful. Alex is my fave. So I think we also have to talk about family dynamics, right? Because we have a lot of that in this yeah. section. Because I mean, uh, you know, Luke is kind of really, you know, he, he, I don't confront's not the right word. What's the word I'm looking for? You know, he he goes to see his father. He goes to see his mother, and Oliver is there. You know, to provide that support that, you know, both a real boyfriend and a fake boyfriend would. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and so I think we should start with um, going to see the mom, his mom, because I am a full-on stand for her. <laughs> like her uh, watching RuPaul's Drag Race and like not realizing at first that RuPaul in the workroom and RuPaul on the um, runway are the same person cracked me up. Also, um, never want to eat that special curry with the bananas. Like, <laughs> oh, and Judy's freaking dog names every time. Um, what is it? It's Charles, Camilla, and Michael of Kent. Like, we're all wonderful members of the British royal family, basically. Yes, so. right. Yeah. Like, it's just which it's so that's funny. that's funny in itself. But I also find it hilarious when dogs have human names. <laughs> Like yeah, I, like a dog named Michael. <laughs> oh, interesting. I, I was like, I, I, I'm trying. To, I don't know if that's a. I don't know if that's a cultural thing, but I'm really used to dogs having human names. Like I think. Um, I think that's a very British thing. Well, I um. I like. I mean, yeah, maybe it is, but yes, though. So yeah, they're, they're all. I just. I want. I wanted them all to be named after increasingly obscure members of the royal family, and obviously there is a Princess Michael of Kent, who is, I think, Prince. It's. In a way, it's kind of misogynistic, because actually it's, it's Prince Michael of Kent's wife is called Princess Michael of Kent, but, um, uh... Yeah, I don't know. I just, like, that part was really funny. So we get to see Oliver with Luke's mom, and it's, like, a really... Even though there's a little bit of, um, Luke being Luke and, um, you know, being embarrassed and all of that kind of stuff, like, it's a really heartwarming scene. And then, of course, we have the scene with his dad. Mm -hmm. Want to talk about that, Katie? <laughs> <laughs> I <No>? mean, <laughs> <laughs> I think I just I love it because it's another section with Oliver coming to his defense and yeah. kind of continuing to solidify um, their relationship. And uh, I don't know that it it was well, like heartwarming in a different way. But I think like when it's it's also earlier in the chapter when they're having a sleepover, I think at, I think it's when they're at Luke's doing it. And it really kind of hits him that like, fuck, my dad has cancer. Mm -hmm. And like, he, he has to, he, I mean, he, he doesn't have to deal with it, but he's, he's dealing with it. And Oliver's just kind of like, is he's there to support him. Like he doesn't care whatever he chooses to do in relation to how he wants to deal with his dad, but he's like, whatever it is, I'm here. Yeah. Um, so even though Luke has interesting relationships with his parents, he does have a wonderful friend group who um, are just really supportive and they help him clean his apartment back that we were talking about in the beginning. I think we have to t just mention the dick pics again. I know we talked about it in the Q&A, but that whole like idea is hilarious and one of my favorite parts of this section is when Oliver texts Luke, I think it's Richard Chamberlain maybe, and um, he get Luke gets caught smiling at his phone oh, and the James well, Royce Royce is like, what? Yeah, because they're at his house cleaning when he gets it. And yeah. he's like, are you smiling at, at your, your phone? phone? <laughs> Yes, and then there's that whole text conversation in the WhatsApp group, and I don't know, the, like, Did they changed running... the name of the, the group. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and the running dick pic joke through the whole book is so funny. I mean, that's why I had that dick pic joke animation put together. I'm sure Katie was really sick of me talking about how much I loved it before the book came out. It was But I was so like, funny. it's she showed it to me before I had read the book, so I was like, I mean, this is funny, but I don't entirely get it, but now that I've read the book, I'm like, this is absolutely hilarious. Yeah, it's really funny. Um, okay, so I think we should end on talking about how the section ends, which is Luke being in the bathroom and seeing that old dude from the beginning of the video, or the beginning of the book has <laughs> finally written that article that he knew was coming and yeah. um, him starting to possibly freak out. So um, it sets us up for the next section. Um, 
and I can't wait to see, well, I know how it happens because <laughs> I read it, you know, three or four times, whatever. Um, but it's a really good end to the section. Um, Alexis, do you want to talk about, like, that whole situation? Oh, gosh, uh, ironically, I think because I was taking exclusive two rather than inclusive two, I was thinking, okay, so it's going, so we're talking about up to that bit, but not the bit where he reads Cam's article. So I, I again, <laughs> did not have prepared statements. Um, I mean, it's, um, it's, it, it, I try to think what to say about it. Um, yeah, obviously it's really, really emotionally devastating for Luke for a whole bunch of reasons. I think, I think one of the things that I, because one of the things you said was there was something he knew was coming, and actually it's, I think it's important to realize it's something he feared was coming, but actually, first of all, there's an extent to which he always fears it's coming, and it's usually irrational. Um, and obviously he's in no way prepared for it. Um, part of, I will admit there's always part, also part of me that's, Again, one does not like to blow one's own trumpet, but there's a, t a tiny part that's, that's really proud of what an absolute prick Cam comes across as in the article because it's it, it was my best pre pretentious journalist isn't as clever as he thinks he is um, voice, which I, I, I hope came through. Mm -hmm. But um, no, it was um, it was it, 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 it's there for the purposes that you know, basically it's a necessary part part of the emotional part of the book is that you have you have a a down moment at that point and there are actually a number of, of, of uh, back and forth with, with, with my editor and um, uh, like the, the notion of something from Cam coming up at this point actually wasn't in the first draft. Um, oh, it's actually it was actually, it, it's um. Again, um, one of the things I'll always say is that is a, I, writing is rewriting is such a cliche, but um, uh, whenever, whenever people ask the plotter or, whenever I get the plotter or panther question, what I'll always say is actually like the version of the book you read isn't the version of the book I first wrote, and there's off, I, I edit it very deeply. And so, yeah, that, that whole bit, which is like, this, this is an incredibly important part of the book, is something that I very much worked with my editor. It came through from thinking about kind of how the conflict was structured and there was a need for uh, you know, a real conflict point there and bringing came back made sense. Um, I'm really happy with how it turned out. I think it's a really good scene. I hope, again, it's a little, I, I hope people have reacted to it as if it's a good scene. I don't really get to say it's a good scene or not. It's a good scene. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. But, um, yeah. but yeah, no, I think it really, really, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's basically it's like a rug. It ties the room together, you know? Yeah. Um, only, you know, schematically. We move into yeah. the, the the final act, yeah. per se. Right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Alexis. This was really, um, really fun. Thank you. I'm glad. And we will be talking about the rest of the book next week. Don't forget that you can um, enter to win a signed book plate from Alexis. So we will link to that below. And um, tell us what you think about the book so far down in the comments and we will see you next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.